Welcome back, viewers. In the last episode, we built a cat button app that introduced you some basics of interacting with web services. Today, we're going to build on that by adding another step into the process, parsing JSON data. Our cat web service responds with an image, which is very unusual. Web services typically respond with JSON, or God forbid, XML, that provides some metadata including URLs for images which then need to be retrieved in subsequent steps, just like the Fox Image API here that we are integrating today. Let's take a closer look. It has one web service that we'll call that returns this simple JSON. The JSON object has two attributes, an image and a link. We only care about the image, so we'll need to call this service, parse out the image property, and then make another call to download the image. Sound good? Let's get started by opening the code base from episode 6. You can find this in the GitHub repository where you can find the code from all our episodes. Let's start in the storyboard. We need to add a fox button. Let's have the fox button and the cat button side by side. Select the cat button and using the fifth tab of the inspector where the constraints live, find the constraint for a line trailing two. Select it and hit delete on your keyboard to remove it. Then let's duplicate it using the Alt key while we click and drag to the right. Let's add a constraint to the left button to make it exactly half as wide as the view it's in. Right click and drag outside the button and let go. Select equal widths in the context menu. Then find the new constraint in the constraint tab and change it to one to two using this colon syntax. Now that our left button is looking good, let's fix the right button. Right click on it and drag outside to the right and select trailing space to safe area. Do the same on the top, selecting top space to safe area. Right click again and drag over to the left button and select horizontal spacing. Lastly, right click and drag to the image view and select vertical spacing. Now the left and right constraints need to be set to zero. So select them and change the constant to zero in the constraint tab. Now they are equal widths side by side. Let's change the left button to a fox. We can do that with the emoji keyboard, which you open with control command space. I'm gonna filter for fox and add that for my title. Now I'll change the cat button to one of these creepy cat faces to match. I'm not sure who designed these cat emoji, but they're up there with Chucky if you ask me. <laughs> now we need to connect these buttons to code. We can do that most easily with the assistant editor. Type Command Shift O and type View, and once you have View Controller highlighted, you can hold the Alt key while you hit Enter, and it will open the View Controller class in the Assistant Editor. First, let's delete the Refresh button. We will replace that in a moment with two outlets. And then let's change Did Tap Refresh button to Did Tap Cat button. Then right click on the cat button and drag a new referencing outlet into the View Controller class. And once you have a blue line above Image View, let go and then name the outlet Cat button. Don't forget to use camel case as we discussed in the last episode. Do the same thing with the fox button and name it fox button. Next, we will add our tap actions. Scroll down to did tap cat button and drag a touch up inside event into the code below that function. Let go and name it did tap fox button. Lastly, right click on the cat button and drag a touch up inside event on top of the did tap cat button function that's already there. Notice how Xcode highlights the entire function when you hover over it. Now close the assistant editor and go back to the view controller class if necessary. Before we go nuts with the new API integration, let's refactor a few things. I don't like the way we're setting the image, starting and stopping the activity indicator, and disabling and re-enabling the buttons within the functions below. And now that we're adding a second button and more functions for downloading the Fox, this would very quickly get ugly and we don't want that. We want anyone looking at this code to be able to grok it as quickly as possible. So after this UI image property, add curly brackets, and inside we will add a did set observer. That will allow us to respond to changes in the image property. Whenever a new image is set, we will set the image to the image view like this. Next, we will do the same thing for our other UI elements by adding a new property as a Boolean called active. Active means it's downloading data, so the activity indicator should be animating and the button should be disabled. If active is false, then the opposite is true. We're using an observer for this as well, and we'll move all this code in here until everything is all nice and tidy like a conmarried sock drawer. Note that we disable and enable both of the buttons at the same time. Now we just have to set the active property to true when we are downloading stuff, and then set it to false when we're done. Now let's prep this file for the new Fox functionality. We will start integrating with the Fox API. 
Start by adding a download Fox function and then add a call to that in the did tap Fox button action. Here's a good place to run the app just to make sure we're moving in the right direction. Okay, it's working as expected. The cat functionality is still fine, but the Fox isn't working yet. No surprise there. Let's grab this URL and move it to the top where it's a little easier to find. Generally, it's not good practice to have constants inside a main class definition. We'll put it above the class definition as cat service URL and add the Fox service URL below it. Go down here and make sure we put the cat service URL constant where we ripped the URL out. Now that the UI is ready to go, we're almost ready to start programming. First, we need to install CocoaPods. The best programmers know that reinventing the wheel is a waste of resources, and therefore any programming framework worth using is going to have some method of integrating third-party code. Swift has an elegant solution called package management, but it's still a bit young, so we'll need to use a Ruby-based dependency management system called CocoaPods. For more information about CocoaPods, Google it. Open the terminal app and use the cd command to find the directory where you've saved your project. You will need to make sure you have Ruby and Ruby gems installed, but they come with all Macs, so you should be fine. To install CocoaPods, it's just one command, sudo gem install CocoaPods, and then type your password. This does assume your account has admin privileges. Now that we have it installed, we will initialize this project to use CocoaPods by typing pod in it and hit enter. You can see that creates this new file called pod file, which we will open in Xcode. First, we will need to add it to the project. Right click here, add files, find the pod file in the finder window and add it. Now go into that file and we will configure it to use two CocoaPods, Alamo Fire to download data and images, which is much better than the method we used in the last episode, and Swifty JSON, which is a super easy and clean way to parse JSON data. You can parse JSON without this pod, but it requires many more lines of code. Now go back to the terminal briefly and issue the command pod install to install these two pods in the project. Once it's done, you'll notice it instructs us to open a new file called an Xcode workspace file rather than the raw Xcode project file. So close your Xcode project and in the terminal type open and then the name of the new Xcode workspace folder. It looks pretty much the same except the navigator pane on the left now has a section for pods. Since we're doing everything better this time, let's add a small layer of abstraction to prevent our view controller class from getting too bloated. Hopefully you remember from episode three that you want to keep view controllers as simple as possible and rely on models and helper classes to do complex operations. Because of that, we will create a new class called Fox Service, and this class will be in charge of interacting with the Fox web service and will hand an image file back to the view controller class. From the navigator pane, right click and select new file, Coco touch class, Make sure it's a subclass of NSObject and name it Fox Service. Take note how we don't name classes using camel case. We use traditional title case. The only notable difference being that the first word is also capitalized. Let's add some properties like the web service URL, which we will pass into this class when we create it. We'll also have a completion handler, which is a block or closure that we pass to this class and it will execute that whenever it encounters an error or retrieves an image. Closures are one of those more modern additions to iPhone programming and they are really enjoyable to work with. Next, let's add an initializer where we simply accept and set the properties from the arguments. We will have a public function that gets called from our view controller class when a user taps the Fox button action. And we will also have a function we call to execute the completion handler. Wrapping it here is not necessary, but it is a little bit cleaner. We'll make sure the completion handler is called from the main thread so that the view controller can change the UI without worrying about thread safety. This isn't actually necessary because Alamo Fire will do it for us, but it's important that you be thinking about these things. Notice that the completion handler looks just like any other function. We mark the image argument as optional. If we encounter an error, we will turn nil for the image, which just saves us the trouble of having two completion blocks, one for failure and one for success. Next, we'll add a private function called retrieve JSON. It's private because we don't want any view controller or external file to execute this function. It should only be executed by objects of this class. Now let's import Alamo Fire and Swifty JSON so we can use them. Pretty simple, right? Make sure you save and build with command S, command B so Xcode can preload these modules and autocomplete for us. Now let's make the request to the web service using Alamo Fire like this. It's very straightforward. We use response JSON so that Alamo Fire will give us a JSON string in the completion block. 
In our typical Swift way, we will use a conditional, the if statement, to get the value from the response and assign it to JSON string. Inside the conditional, we will get the JSON as JSON like this. This uppercase JSON function is provided by Swifty JSON. We want to stay on top of our error handling, so we will add the else and call the completion handler with nil. Failing to call this when any error occurs means the UI will be broken. Let's log the JSON to the console using print and add a call to this function up here in download. Now let's integrate this service class with our view controller. Add a new property called Fox Service of Fox Service type. We'll mark it optional. In download Fox, which is the function called by the user when they tap the Fox button, we will initialize the Fox Service helper class and call download on it. We need to be a little careful about how we do that. Since we marked the Fox service as optional, we will check for its existence, and if it's nil, we will create it using the initializer we created in the Fox service class. Inside the completion block, check to see if we have an image, and then assign it to the view controller's image property. With the refactoring we did earlier, this will automatically display it to the user. Don't forget to set the UI state to active at the top of this function, and reset it inside the completion block. Notice we will do it regardless of whether we have an image or not. Then outside the conditional, we will make the call to download, which kicks off the web service request. Let's run this and see if we're able to get our JSON data to print to the console. Click the Fox button and go back to Xcode. Let's check out the console. We have some data printed. Let's compare that to what we know the data looks like. It has an image key and a link key, and we see both of those in the console. We're making good progress here, and all we need to do now is grab the image URL from the JSON and then download the image and hand it back to the view controller. So we will create another private function and call it retrieve image. Let's add a printout here with the image URL because we're gonna run into a problem later when we try to download the image and it'll be good to know where we are in the code when that happens. Now we will call this function where we are printing out the JSON. Delete that and call self.retrieve image and pass it the image URL from the JSON. Swifty JSON uses subscripting syntax which looks a lot more like a dictionary which is part of what makes it faster and easier to use. Make sure to tack on string value on the end. That ensures we get a string representation of the image URL. Now that we've connected these two methods, use AlamoFire again to download the image. This time we will use the response image function, which is great because instead of giving us a path to the image data or something, it just hands us a UI image. However, that function is actually included in another CocoaPod, one called AlamoFire image, so let's add that to our pod file real quick and then run back to the terminal to install it with pod install. You can see that it added the one pod we needed and didn't touch anything else. You'll need to close the project and reopen it or Xcode may not register the new CocoaPod. Don't forget to import AlamoFire image up here. And now we have the response image function available. Inside AlamoFire's completion handler for this image download request, we will just execute this class's completion handler. Let's run this and see where we are. Click the Fox button, no Fox image. Let's look at the console. App Transport Security has blocked a clear text HTTP resource load since it is insecure. Temporary exceptions can be configured by your app's info.plist file. What this means is that Apple is encouraging you to only trust web services that use SSL. You've used SSL anytime you've visited a website that has a lock next to the URL, which at this point is most of them. While the original web service URL for the Fox service is indeed HTTPS over SSL, the image URL it gives us is only HTTP. It's not secure. Therefore, we need to add an exception for the images. Do that by selecting the project at the top of the navigator pane and then select the info tab. Right click anywhere and select add row. Set the key to app transport security settings. Change the type to dictionary. Hit the plus button and change the new key to exception domains. Change the type to dictionary and add another item in here. In this item, we will enter the domain of our image URL, randomfox.ca. This also needs to be a dictionary, and yet another row inside this dictionary and enter NS exception allow insecure loads like this. Set the type to Boolean and set the value to yes. If this seems pedantic to you, you are not alone. Run the app again and see if we get a fox. Success! But let's fix the aspect ratio because these images must be a lot smaller than our cat images. Let's change it to aspect fit and run it again. I'm loving it. 
Holy cow, we did a lot in this episode. I hope you aren't feeling overwhelmed. I kind of threw a lot at you today, but rest assured that once you understand this, you are well on your way to being a solid iPhone programmer. If you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. If you have questions about this episode or suggestions for future episodes, leave us comments and we'll make sure to read all of them. In the meantime, if you need me, I'll be here looking at foxes.